Welcome everyone back to um, CS264A Automated Reasoning. Uh, this is our lecture seven. What we'll do today is um, continue the transition from uh, the first part of foundation to the second part. We started that transition um, last time and um, by talking about uh, beyond NP problems and how uh, logical reasoning and symbolic reasoning in particular can uh, play a role in solving these problems. So we will finish uh, this story today and then we'll end up transitioning into the second part of foundation, uh, which is the subject of tractable circuits and knowledge uh, compilation. So we will uh, uh, start with beyond NP and then uh, move into that. So I'm gonna head now uh, to the whiteboard so that we can um, start our discussion. Last time we talked about uh, four complexity classes uh, that uh, we'll be interested in and they're listed here, uh, starting with the class NP, which uh, I guess many people are familiar with, and then moving to uh, further classes like PP, NP to the PP, and PP to the PP. We'll get to know what these are um, today. And what we did last time is uh, we talked briefly about Bayesian networks, which is a type of probabilistic graphical models. And we looked at four problems of interest on these models. And we mentioned that the decision version of these four problems are complete for these corresponding classes. Um, complete means basically that they're, they're the hardest in these corresponding uh, classes. And what we also mentioned is that it happens that the prototypical problems for these complexity classes are all on Boolean formula. So those prototypical problems are also complete. Of course, that's part of the definition of being prototypical. So each one of these problems is also hardest for the corresponding class. Now, we didn't talk about these problems yet. We will do today. But the idea was that uh, we can solve problems in these classes like the ones we discussed here by uh, reducing them to the corresponding problems on Boolean formula. And today we'll see one example reduction of that. So the idea, if we do the reduction and we solve these, then we have also solved those guys. But then the solution is based on symbolic manipulations on these uh, Boolean formula. And we also mentioned that one way to systematically solve these problems on Boolean formula is by compiling these Boolean formula into uh, what we call tractable circuits. Uh, these are Boolean circuits with some particular properties. So the big picture is you wanna solve this guy, you reduce it to a problem on a Boolean formula, you compile that Boolean formula into a tractable circuit, and then you'll find that by operating on this uh, in polynomial time, typically in linear time, then you've solved the original problem. So what we'll do next is um, quickly go over these problems that we mentioned last time as a review. And then we go into these four problems on Boolean formula, which are prototypical for these. And then we'll show one example reduction uh, from this part to that part. And that basically would be this transition story about solving beyond NP problems using symbolic manipulations. And then we'll get started with the second part of the foundation, which is focused on tractable circuit and this process of knowledge compilation, which takes us from Boolean formula to circuits of appropriate type. So once more, um, this is a Bayesian network. And as we mentioned uh, last time, it's made of two parts, a graph, which is a directed acyclic graph. You can think of it as capturing our perceptions of causality. And we talked about quantifying this graph using these probability distributions, which are organized in the form of tables known as conditional probability tables. Uh, we'll say a bit more about the meaning of this uh, later. And as we discussed last time, uh, there were four problems that are listed here, MPE, MAR, MAP, and SDP, which are complete for the corresponding classes. These are all problems on Bayesian networks. And uh, we'll just very quickly go through them next, just to remind you before we go and talk about the Boolean 
problems or the problems on Boolean formulas that are also complete and prototypical in this case. So this is the uh, very first uh, problem, which we said uh, is uh, NP-complete. And that was the problem where you fix the value of some variables in the Bayesian network, and then you try to find the state or the most likely state of the remaining variables. It's kind of an optimization problem. And the decision version of this is NP-complete. And we also talked about uh, the second problem, which is marginals or computing marginals, where I'm trying to compute uh, the probability of some events, like what is the probability that someone has a condition or what's the probability that someone is a female, given that they tested positive on both T1 and T2. And we said that the decision version of this is PP complete. And the problem after that was uh, called MAP. This is similar to MPE, except that uh, I'm finding the most likely state of a set of variables that uh, is defined by the user. So the input is the Bayesian network, and then some evidence, and then a set of variables. In this case, these two guys that are highlighted, that I'm trying to find the most likely state of these two uh, guys. And as we said, the decision version of this is NP to the PP complete. Again, when, when we talk about the uh, Boolean problems uh, that are prototypical for the, these classes, you get a sense of what these different classes are. Um, and finally, we talked about the problem of uh, SDP or same decision probability. And in this case, we, we treated the Bayesian network as a classifier. So we have features and we have a class variable. We know some of the features, like in this case, we know that the scanning test is negative. We compute a posterior on the uh, class variable and we check against the threshold and reach a decision. And so under scanning uh, being false, the decision is no, this patient is not pregnant. And uh, the idea is we may be able to find the value of some other variables, uh, which are specified by the user. In this case, it's urine and blood test. And I wanna know what is the probability that the decision will stick uh, after observing these two uh, variables. And that is the same decision probability. In this case, it's this number. And as we mentioned, the decision version of this is PP to the PP um, complete. All right, so what we'll do next is um, look at these uh, complexity classes, but then look at uh, the prototypical problems, uh, problems that are complete, um, for these classes, but they're also, they represent them. They give the spirit, the just the essence of these complexity classes. And as mentioned earlier, they're all problems on Boolean formula. And you know, one of them, SAT, of course, we also actually kind of know MASH SAT. So we'll walk through these in this order, starting with this and then this and then this and then that. Okay, so first one. Sets viability. We spent quite a bit of time on this already, so it should be quite familiar. We have a Boolean formula, in this case, A or B and not C. And the sad problem is simply, is there a satisfying instantiation for that formula? So what we have here is three variables, A, B, C, and therefore eight possible instantiations. And what SAT is trying to do is there one of them that satisfy the formula? The answer here is yes. And here's an, an example instantiation that satisfies this formula. Now, if, if I were to give you this guy and I say, does it satisfy the formula? As we already know, it's that's easy to check, right? You simply take the values of A being true, B being true, C being false. You plug these into this formula and evaluate it and will either evaluate to true or false. And that tells us whether that formula is satisfied or not by this instantiation. Now, this is important to stress here because this gives you the gist of the class NP, and you may have heard the story. Uh, what I'm doing here is searching in an exponential space, right? Because the number of possibilities you have to consider is exponential in the number of variables. So I do have an exponential space and I'm looking for some member in that space that satisfy a property. But the characteristic thing about NP is that if I give you a candidate like this instantiation and I say, is this the guy you're looking for? That's easy to check. 
Okay, that's important to stress because now you'll see for some of the other classes we're going to be looking at that there where things start making a difference. All right, so I'm searching in an exponential space to find something. And if I give you a candidate and I say, is this the guy you're looking for? It's easy to check. Okay, let's now go to the uh, second class. And uh, this is MASHSAT. And again, I have a Boolean formula. But now the question is, are the majority of instantiations satisfying? So in this case, I'm not just looking for one guy. I basically have to kind of count the number of candidates that satisfy the given property. And this case, in this case, the answer is no, because I have eight instantiations, and it turns out that only three of them, the ones that are highlighted here, only these three satisfy the formula, and that's not a majority. Three is not a majority out of eight. So the answer is no. So what you'll see here is, for this class, PP compared to NP, is that again, if I show you a candidate and I say, is this a guy that you kind of need to count? Checking that is easy, right? Because again, I just substitute and I see whether that candidate satisfies the formula. The difference with the previous class is I'm not just looking for one guy. In a sense, I need to check or count uh, the uh, number of guys that actually satisfy uh, the formula. Now, there are two variations on MASHSAT that gets used in practice. You already know one of them, uh, which we call sharp SAT or model counting, where I give you a number instead of a yes, no answer. So we're going to get these to these two variations. And there's another variation you're not yet uh, familiar with. At least we did not discuss it. And it's the one that gets used in practice. But we'll get to these in just a little bit. Let's move on to the next two classes. Um, and you'll see in those two classes, I need, in addition to a Boolean formula, I need an additional input where I will have to split, or you as a user, you split the variables into two sets, okay? So now we're talking about this class or this problem known as emash sat, which is the prototypical problem for this. So what's going on here? What's the question or what's the problem now that I give you a Boolean formula and a split of the variables? Uh, let me write the question and then we'll explain it or show the question. So now the question is, is there an instantiation of these variables X under which the majority of Y instantiations satisfy the Boolean formula? So let's look at X in this case. X uh, is basically the uh, variable C. That's part of the input, right? And this variable C could either be uh, true or it could be false. So what I'm trying to ask is, um, is there an X instantiation, you know, that is I'm searching through these two guys, C equals true, C equals false, under which, what does under which mean? That is, if you take this formula and condition it, let's say on C true, if you, if you take this formula and condition it on C equals true, you're going to get now a formula over only the variables A, B, and similarly here, right? In fact, let's go ahead and do that. Uh, what happens if I condition this formula on C equals true? What do I get for the formula uh, in that case? Can someone type in what I should get in that case? If I condition this formula and C equals true, uh, people are saying false. And that is correct. And what happens if I condition that formula on C equals false? What do I get? Okay, people are typing. Okay, I'm getting a whole bunch of answers, but uh, no, it should be A or B. That's what this formula should simplify to when I said, because when I said C to false, not false is true, true and something is that something. So what's going on here is, is there an instantiation under which the majority of Y instantiation is satisfying? So here's one instantiation for X, C through, and this is the formula I get. So now I have to ask, is the majority of instantiations satisfy this formula? No. Um, uh, what about this guy? When I set C to false, then uh, the formula becomes this. Are the majority of instantiations satisfying this? And the answer is yes. So in fact, I did find an instantiation of the X variables under which the majority 
of instantiations over y satisfy that formula, right? This is uh, this here. So under C equals false, I have a total of four instantiations and, and three of them do satisfy the formula. And that's why you get the answer, yes, for image sat in this case. So let's see what's happening here. And now you can probably understand this um, NP to the PP. So I am searching over an exponential space. And, and that is the space of instantiations for the variables x, right? So that's an exponential space in general, exponential in the number of variables in the set x. So this is like NP, right? I'm searching in an exponential space. However, if I show you a candidate, that is an instantiation of the x variables, and I say, is this the guy you're looking for? Now it's no longer easy to check to be able to decide whether that is the candidate you're looking for, what do you have to do? You have to go and solve a PP problem. So that's why this is like NP with a PP oracle. So if, if you were to have that oracle that solves PP problems, if, if that was free, then this is just NP, right? But it's NP with a PP oracle. I hope this gives you the gist of what's going on. And now you get to see what these complexity classes and their acronyms mean. Again, I'm searching in an exponential space for something. And if I show you a candidate and I tell you, is this the guy you're looking for to even decide that you have to go and solve a PP problem? Okay, so now we get to the very last one. And I want you to guess that, uh, to think about it. Well, maybe you're not gonna guess because it's already shown here. <clears throat> But I think you can see what's going on, right? This is called mash sat, and it's PP with a PP oracle. So the question is, is there a majority of X instantiations under which the majority of Y instantiations are satisfying? So previously, I was just looking for one instantiation of the X variables. Now, in a sense, I want to count those instantiations of X variables under which the majority of instantiations uh, over Y satisfy. So I'm searching in an exponential space, right? But I'm just not just looking for one guy. I'm actually kind of counting um, <clears throat> those guys that um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to count the number of instantiations of X that satisfy some property. And that property is not easy to check. To, if, if you show me a candidate, which is an instantiation over X, and you say, is this a guy that you need to count? Then I have to go and solve a counting problem to even decide whether to count that. So right, it's a double counting problem. It's like PP with a PP Oracle. So if the Oracle was for free, then this is just like. And the answer in this case, is no, and we've seen that because there are two instantiations uh, for the variable C, C equals true and C equals false. Now, if the answer were to be yes, then the majority here, I have to have both of these instantiations satisfy the condition, but we've just seen that only one of them uh, satisfies the condition, right? So we've seen, for example, that if C was true, uh, then actually nothing satisfies the formula. So one of the instantiations does not satisfy the condition, only the other one, which is C equals false satisfied. And that's not a majority. And that's why we got the answer uh, no in this particular case. All right, so I hope this gives you a sense of what's going on here. Uh, we've got these problems, they're pretty simple, and yet they are prototypical and in a sense characterize these complex uh, complexity classes, which include a lot of interesting problems, right? We've seen from SAT to, uh, if, if we're gonna, sorry, look at the uh, Bayesian networks from optimizing variables uh, to computing marginal probabilities, to optimizing over a subset of variables, to doing value of information, all of these very hard problems um, are basically characterized and abstracted using these very simple things. And uh, as you'll see, uh, if you are able to take these Boolean formulas and compile them into circuits of appropriate type, you solve these problems, right? So, um, which is pretty remarkable. 
because it ends up all reducing to symbolic manipulations. And there might be a part of this that's still mysterious, uh, and we'll try to bridge that gap next by showing you one of the reductions uh, from probabilistic reasoning to uh, these things. But let's first talk about the two variations that I promised you on MASH SAT. The first one is, uh, which you already know, that's model counting or a sharp set, what's known as sharp set, where it, this is the functional version of MASH SAT. So MASH SAT is a decision problem, yes, no answer. And sharp set it wants a number back, needs the count, right? So I have this Boolean formula and I want to, how many assignments satisfy the Boolean formula. And in this case, it's three. These are the only three instantiations that actually satisfy this. So I, need, I want that number. But the other variation and the one that really gets used in practice and the one we were going to use in the reduction that I'm going to show you uh, is known as weighted model counting. All right, weighted model counting or WMC. And what happens here is uh, when you look at the variable instantiations, I end up assigning weights to every a way to every instantiation, right? And then I don't want you just to count the satisfying assignments. I want you to add their weights. So in this particular case, the weighted model count would be adding this number and this number and that number, and, and I want this back, all right? Now, you're probably already getting started to see how this is now quite relevant to probabilistic reasoning. But the question that you're probably asking is, where do I get these weights from? or or even more fundamentally, um, how do I specify these, right? So now the input is not just a Boolean formula. The input is a Boolean formula and weights, and there's an exponential number of these. Are you telling me that I'm going to give you a Boolean formula and an exponential number of weights? No. Uh, the weights are specified typically in the following fashion. Uh, you give me a weight for every literal. So for A being true, you give me a weight. And for A being false, you give me a weight. And similarly for the other variables. So that's a linear number of weights. And then we compute the weight of a variable instantiation in this fashion. So let's look at the second guy. The second guy A is true, B is true, and C is false. So I multiply the weight for the positive literal A with the weight for the positive literal B and the weight for the negative literal C because that's false. And that ends up being the weight for this guy. So now the input is actually efficient, right? So if you have n variables, in this case, they're Boolean, then I need from you two, two, two n weights, a linear number of weights together with the Boolean formula, and that defines the weighted model counting problem, all right? So what is left now to finish this transition or motivational story before we go into the second part of foundations is that I want to show you a sample reduction. All right. In particular, I want to show you how you can compute, uh, reduce computing marginals on a Bayesian network into doing weighted model counting. And hopefully that will give you a little bit of a teaser uh, as we go into the second part of the foundation. And of course, about half the course later will just be focused on applications. So we will revisit probabilistic reasoning and uh, do more there with more details later. Uh, so before I go into showing you the reduction, um, any questions until this point? So I'm actually not seeing anything on the board, which is good. Okay, let's actually go ahead and move on here. Okay, so this is the picture that we built so far. And um, we have in each bubble uh, two problems. Both are complete, one from probabilistic reasoning and one on, on, on Boolean formula. And remember, these are the prototypical problems. So what we will do now is just show a reduction here. But the reduction will be from computing marginals, not the decision version, the actual one, the functional where we're computing probabilities. We're going to reduce to weighted model counting, not to match that to weighted model counting. And uh, let's see how this works. Again, this is uh, basically a teaser. Um, you will get the gist of it uh, and hopefully enough to be comfortable or at least try to bridge these different uh, pieces. Okay, so let me show you the um, reduction. And we're going to do it by an example. Um, which should show you how it works more generally. 
And we're going to do it on this small Bayesian network, which has three variables, A, B, and C. Now, in this case, uh, the uh, variables are all binary. So every variable is true or false. That doesn't have to be the case. Of course, with Bayesian networks, you can have uh, discrete variables. They don't have to be binary. And, and more generally, they can even be continuous. But this is restricted to discrete variables. This reduction is for binary variables. But a variation on it will also work if you had more than binary variables. And as we've talked before, to fully specify the Bayesian network, you need these uh, distributions. I'm not putting them in tabular form, but I'm showing them like this. So as we talked, for A, you need a distribution over A. That is the probability of A being true with the probability of A being false. That's the notation we're using here. Now for the variable B, you need two distributions. You need a distribution over B given that A is true, and that's the first two numbers here. And then the distribution over B given that A is false, and those are these two numbers here. All right, you can think of this probability of V being true given that A is false, probability of B being false given that A is false, and similarly for C. So these are what we call parameters, and we had 10 of them, four, four, and two. Now, what we didn't mention uh, is how do you compute the joint distribution over A, B, C? And uh, that actually turns out to be easy. I'm gonna show it here and um, what happens here is here are a b c and here's all possible instantiations of these variables so let's take the first one what is the probability for that instantiation as assigned by this bayesian network it turns out to be very simple you go to every variable and pull one number so you pull one of these two from here you pull one of these four from this you pull one of the four and you multiply them now which one do you pull you pull the ones that are compatible with the variable instantiation all right uh, perhaps let's look at the third guy here. So the third guy is true, false, true. So when I go to A, I'm gonna pull this guy, right? Because A is true. Now, when I go to B, A is true, B is false. So which one do I pick? Uh, I'm, I'm looking here. Uh, then I pick actually B false, A true. I pick this number and that's what's being multiplied here. Now, if I go to C, uh, C is true, its parent is true. So I end up picking this guy and multiplying. Okay, straightforward. Now, why is that the case? That's another story. We're not talking about Bayesian networks now. There is a whole interesting motivation behind all of this, but that's the distribution, okay? So now what we're gonna do is um, we want to be able to compute marginals, uh, but we want to do this uh, by reduction to weighted model counting. Now, again, let's look at what does it mean to compute a marginal. So let's say you want to know the probability that A is false. So what do you do usually? You're going to look at the rows in which A is false, the last four, and you have to add up their corresponding numbers. So in reality, this is going to be one single number. You multiply this by this by this. Okay, so you add these four numbers here, and that's the marginal over A is false, and so on. Now, there are algorithms that will operate on a Bayesian network to give you that, but now we'll show you how you can do this using um, um, weighted model counting. So the reduction is pretty simple. Uh, we will build a Boolean formula that will have the variables A, B, C. It happens in this case, it's, it's a simple reduction because the variables are binary. So we're going to have Boolean variables A, B, C, okay? And we're going to introduce one more type of Boolean variables. And that is for each one of these parameters, I'm going to introduce a Boolean variable that looks like this, P, uh, B given A, okay? And similarly for the others, right? So uh, for this guy here, it will be uh, P, not A. Now, remember, these thetas are real numbers, right? Now, but the corresponding variables that I'm introducing, uh, these are actually um, Boolean variables. And what do these guys mean? Well, what you'll see when I write my Boolean formula, it will have exactly eight models that correspond to these guys. And what these Boolean variables will try to capture is the fact that a particular real valued parameter is present or not in a particular instantiation. All right, so um, let's see how it looks. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and write now the Boolean formula for you, and you'll see how simple it is. Okay, let's now look at the um, 
Boolean formula. It's pretty straightforward. It's made up of these sentences. And what's happening here is if you look at uh, what's going on here, I have A and B if and only if this guy, A and not B if and only if that guy. So what I'm doing is I'm looking at the instantiations of the variable and its parent. And for each one of them, I'm saying if and only if. What does that mean? Remember what we said about this? This means that this parameter is present. So this says if A and B are true, that parameter must be present. And the other way around, if that parameter is present, then A and B must be true. Okay, straightforward. Uh, again, we're, we're just doing this uh, roughly here and briefly. The point that you need to see is how systematic this formula is, and it's easy to generate. And it has two types of variables, the variables from the Bayesian network and these guys. And it happens by construction that this formula will have exactly eight models that correspond to these eight instantiations. Uh, we're not done yet with the reduction. What is still missing is what? What do I have to do to finish this reduction? Uh, what do I have to do to finish this reduction? Can someone type in? What do I need to do? We're reducing to weighted model counting. So I already have a Boolean formula and I need something else. I need the weights, right? I need the excellent. All right, a few people are saying I need the weights here. I need the weights. And that turns out to be straightforward as well. Here's what happens. Um, for the variables that are in the original Bayesian network, ABC, everything gets a weight of one, right? So that's pretty simple. And for the new variables that I introduced, uh, the negative literal will be one. And the only literals that get you know, non-trivial weights are these guys. The positive version of that, they get the actual parameter, the actual number uh, that I have in the Bayesian network. So let's quickly see what's happening here. Again, remember, this is a teaser just to kind of help you mentally bridge the two worlds of symbolic and, and numeric. So as I mentioned, by construction, um, and we're not proving this here, this uh, knowledge base or this Boolean formula that's made up of these has exactly eight models. And let's look at one of them. Here's one of them. Because remember, actually, before I show you this, uh, how many Boolean variables do I have? I have A, B, C, the, the original three, and then I introduced one for every parameter. So I had 10 parameters. So I introduced 10 Boolean variables plus three, that's 13. So uh, when I look at a model of this guy, um, I need to fix the value of 13 variables. Now, this is one of the models which correspond to, I believe, row three here. So look what happens here. A is true, B is true, and C is false. And look what happened to these 10 guys. Uh, the three that correspond to these parameters all appear positively and everything else appears negatively. And that's always going to be the case, right? This is by construction of how we constructed this. You're going to have this property. Now, let's look at the weight of this variable instantiation, right? The weight of all of these literals are one, as we shown here. Now, if you look at this group here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all of them, each one of these guys have a weight of also one. The only ones that get interesting weights are these three. And those exactly are the parameters. So if you look at the weight of this model, this is one model of this guy, what do you get? Exactly what we want, which is uh, this probability. So we have set up a Boolean formula with weights that kind of capture the underlying probability distribution we have. And, and more generally, if you now want to compute the probability of some event, um, and that event is represented by this Boolean formula, all you have to do is add that to the knowledge base. So delta is what we constructed. Delta is, is the yellow guys. The big delta is the yellow guys. And the small delta here is the thing you want to compute the probability of. You simply add it to the knowledge base and run weighted model counting on that, and that gives you a probability, right? So the point is, if you know how to do weighted model counting on a Boolean formula, now you can compute marginals on Bayesian networks. And actually, this is not just for Bayesian networks. This also applies for other things. Okay, someone pointed out that I picked up the wrong uh, row here, and it should be this one. Uh, sorry about that. Yes. And uh, the example we did here is for the second row. Thank you for pointing that out. 
All right, folks. So this is basically what I wanted to say here. And um, let's see, I need to make a couple of more remarks before we jump into um, the next part here. Uh, let me see, are there any other questions? There is a question about what are these? These are uh, logical equivalences. So that means this is like uh, saying A and B implies this and the other way around this implies that. Now, why do we have an equivalence instead of implication? Um, again, so that we make sure that this knowledge base end up having precisely eight models that correspond to these guys. Now, we're not going over this reduction in detail as far as proofs and so on, but I'm assuming we're basically um, we're just trying to get a sense of what's going on here. Let's see. Uh, we need to just go back to this big picture, and we're basically now ready to transition into our second uh, part of foundations, where we're going to start talking about uh, tractable circuits and uh, their properties, and then later as part of that discussion, the compilation of a Boolean formula into these uh, tractable uh, circuits. So let me start here by uh, mentioning that the tractable circuits we're going to be looking at uh, will all be subsets of uh, a particular class of circuits uh, that is known as a negation normal form. So in negation normal form circuits look like this. Uh, you have three types of gates, and, and, or, and not. However, the inverters only appear next to inputs. So in this case, I have this input, I'm, I'm passing it directly, and this input now I'm negating it and, and so on. So it, 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 there is a layer of either inputs or inputs that are inverted. And from there on, there are, you can only have AND or OR gates. So uh, this is the class, you're gonna see this is a pretty powerful class and everything we're gonna be looking at will be based on this. And the story goes like this. So you have some Boolean formula and you compile it into one of these NNF circuits. Now, the NNF circuit itself is not that interesting, but when you start putting properties on it, you end up getting different types of circuits and there's a lot of them. And we're gonna mention when we get to the next set of slides, we're gonna expose you to some of these circuit types. But eventually, we'll end up focusing on a select subset of them that have been influential. But the idea is, depending on what kind of a circuit type you get, you can do things like SAT in linear time. So for a certain type of circuits, uh, SAT will be linear. For another type of circuits, MASH SAT and SHARP SAT and weighted will be linear and, and so on, all the way up to MASH MASH SAT then you can do that in linear time if you had the appropriate uh, circuit type. So typically we're interested in getting a circuit, circuit type so that the problem becomes polynomial, but as we'll see, they'll end up being typically linear in the size of the circuit. This is some of the example circuit types and there is quite a bit uh, more. So what I'm gonna be doing next is I will be uh, flipping to another set of slides where we're gonna go and start this story about tractable circuits and uh, eventually knowledge compilation. And then we'll have all of our tools that we need to basically start doing uh, applications. And the question here is, can we always convert a problem to a tractable circuit? Yes. Um, these circuit representations are what we call universal. They can capture anything. Of course, the question is, what's the complexity of that compilation process? Uh, but the point, folks, is that at the computational level, you are reducing this whole story that involves so much in terms of uh, problems and problem types to one simple process of compilation, taking a Boolean formula and converting it to a circuit with appropriate type is just such a fantastic and elegant uh, formulation of computation. And um, you'll get to know a lot about this as, as we go on. Okay, so we're getting almost to our break time and I need to switch slides. So what I suggest is we take our break now. Thank you and we will resume in 10 minutes.